The scripture reading this evening will be taken from 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to that judges righteously. Who his own self bear his sins, bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open them to Psalm 23. For those who are here this morning, you know that Troy did a very uh, good job of teaching us from John chapter 10, the concept of Jesus being the good shepherd. Now, as a matter of fact, the passage that was just read described that again, uh, that he's the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And, and as you read through the New Testament, there's this idea that, that Christ is our shepherd. What I want to impress upon you tonight is that the idea of God being a shepherd over his people is not new to the New Testament. As a matter of fact, as you read throughout the Old Testament, the that idea that God is the shepherd of his people is, is really an important one. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that that's one of the reasons why the people got so mad at Jesus claiming to be the shepherd, uh, the good shepherd, is because they understood, wait a second, God's the shepherd. And, and so if God's the shepherd and Jesus is saying, I'm the shepherd, well, what's Jesus saying about himself? And they found it blasphemous. And, and, and those who didn't believe the things about Jesus that they should believe got upset about it and, and, and aggravated by it. And so what we, we read throughout the Bible is that God shepherds his people. He oversees his people. He watches over his people. As we think about the Old Testament, probably the most well-known passage in the Bible that, that talks about that principle is the 23rd Psalm. And what I want to do tonight is, is go through that Psalm. Now, not necessarily are we going to go verse by verse with it. I just want to talk about generally what it's about and then, and then pull out some application from it. And so if you have your Bibles open to Psalm 23, we'll go ahead and read it and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Psalm 23 says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, you might see right before that psalm starts that it says it's a psalm of David. You know, one of the important things to realize and to look at when you're trying to understand a passage, uh, really anywhere in the Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, one of the things that will really help you in your Bible study is understanding who is it who wrote this. Okay, so when you understand that David is the one who penned this letter, there's certain things that need to come to your mind. And there's certain things about David that really will, if, if you let it, really will make this psalm mean, in a sense, that much more to you. Okay, a couple things we know about David. One, he was a shepherd. You think about him early in life, and, and what we know about him when we're first introduced to him is that he was a shepherd. We might think of him as the, as the great king, and we'll talk about that. But when he was a child, when he was young, he was a shepherd. And so because we know that about him, when he starts describing God as a shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, 
I believe that it just means that much more to him. It probably meant more to him than, than it could ever mean to me because there's things he gets about it that I don't get. There's things he understands about shepherds and what they do that I just probably won't ever understand because I'm not a shepherd. I, 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 the closest I've ever gotten to, to being a shepherd is going to a petting zoo, right? I mean, that's, that's about the, the closest I get to sheep. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know how to take care of them. I don't know the first thing about them. I do know this, at least this is what I've been told. They're not particularly smart animals, right? That, that they get themselves into a lot of trouble. And, and they will wander off into places they shouldn't wander off into. Now, again, all the, this isn't from experience. I've just, I've, these are just things I've read and I've been told that, that a sheep will actually walk off a cliff if, if the shepherd doesn't keep it from doing so. Is that they just kind of follow the, 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 I don't even know what you call a pack, a flock, whatever it is. They just kind of follow the, the, the other sheep around and, and, and they go around and if one gets into trouble and they get into trouble, they're not strong creatures, right? I mean, there, there's some animals that, that if, if you go to pick a fight with them, they can fight back. But what's a sheep going to do against a wolf? That's not strong. It's, it's not a vicious animal. There's, there, it doesn't have a lot of, 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 muscle or or any other thing to, to protect it it's just kind of defenseless and and just in need of guidance and in need of provision and david understood that david understood what sheep were like and and we even read through uh, david's early life and in first samuel we read about you know times where, where he was tending to to the flock and and a wolf or a, a bear would come and David fought the bear. A lion would come, and David fought the lion. He got it. He got what it was to be a shepherd, that sometimes a shepherd puts himself in the way that, that a shepherd knows the sheep and provides for the sheep, and the sheep can't take care of themselves. The, the, the sheep are defenseless, and the sheep are, are not intelligent creatures, and the, the sheep are just kind of weak, and they need somebody to protect it, and they need somebody to take care of it. And so when David says this, and he gets this, and he says, the Lord is my shepherd. So I'm like that sheep. I, I, I need someone to guide me. I need, I need, I need someone to lead me. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I, I, I can't get through this life by myself. I need protection. I need provision. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The, the idea of, of want there, uh, that, that word is used 23 times in the Old Testament. The majority of the time is translated as lack. Okay, So, so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. I, there, there, there's, there, it, it, there's nothing that I don't have that I need. The, the shepherd looks after the sheep and provides for them all that they need. And so he takes them to, to green pastures where they can graze and they could lay and, and they could be protected. He takes them by side still waters. I mean, if it's, if it's rushing waters and they might get themselves into trouble and get killed, but, but it's still waters where they can go and, and they can drink. And he just, he thinks for them and he provides for them and he takes care of them. And so David thinks of himself and, 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 and what God means. He says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He says in verse 4, Yea, though I, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, a, a rod was, uh, well, it's a rod. You know what a rod is. I mean, it was, it was used as a weapon. When, when an animal would come, a wolf or, or, or some beast would come and try to take a sheep, the rod would be used to protect it. The, the, the staff was a little bit different. The staff was, was that, that long um, stick, a staff, that, that had a hook at the end of it. And if, if a sheep kind of fell down off of a cliff or got itself into trouble, then they'd be able to reach out with that hook and kind of pull it back up. I mean, just all used to protect the sheep. And, and so here's sheep, and, and, and they get themselves into all kinds of predicaments. They, they, they can't figure their, take care of things for themselves. And yet they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, they walk through dangerous places, and, and they're not afraid. Why? Because the shepherd's there. And David says... 
The Lord's my shepherd. David, no, he got himself into some bad situations. David, David did some things that were not smart. David did some things that were really bad. And yet, who got him through those times? God did. And, and, and other things were brought upon David. I mean, it wasn't just his own fault always. Sometimes it was the fault of others. I mean, you think about Saul, and, and you think about the Philistines, and you think about all these others who wanted to harm David, and yet David's alive, and David's living, and, and, and even David's prospering. Why? It's because the Lord's a shepherd, and God's taking care of him. Okay, so, so you have to think about David as a shepherd, but also important is, is David was not just a shepherd, he was a king. And you think about David, you think early in his life and he was a shepherd taking care of sheep, but as he got older, uh, he was king. God chose him to be king. And so he kind of understood this idea of what a king does and, and that a king watches out for the people of, of his land. And, and I believe you see kind of a change uh, in verse 5 and 6 that, than what he's been talking about in verses 1 through 4. He's talking about something different now. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about David. I mean, what we know is this. He was a shepherd who God called to be king. And when he became king, his life, I mean, I guess changed about as much as life can change, right? I mean, kind of the, the, the ultimate rags to riches type story. I mean, he, he, was, he was poor, shepherd, he was king, most powerful rich man in the world. And yet, not only was he given money and, and power and, and all those different things, you also know that when he became king, people started to hate him in ways that people didn't hate him before. People started to want him hurt and dead in ways that that had never happened before. There's no indication that as a shepherd, he had a whole lot of people seeking to harm him. But when he became a king, he did. I mean, he had enemies now. He was surrounded. His kingdom was surrounded by people who wanted harm caused to him they wanted to hurt him they wanted to kill him and we read about the time when God chose him that all of a sudden now Saul is mad and, and Saul wants to kill him and and yet not not only Saul but but the Philistines and all those people outside wanted to harm David and yet David was there sitting at a table <laughs> surrounded by enemies and he's alive he's prospering he's rich he's taken care of more enemies than, than I suspect probably any of us have, and yet he's taken care of. And not only taken care of, he says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. I mean, the, the, the cup of blessings that he's drinking, I just never runs dry. I mean, it's always there. It's always filled. It's so full it's running over. His blessings just, just continually are showered upon David. And he thinks of what God does for him, though he's in a place with so many enemies and so many who want to harm him. He's blessed beyond measure. He says in verse 6, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So not only has God blessed him among his enemies, but, but David suspects that this is going to last throughout his life and, and, and even forever. Why? It's because of God. It's because of what God does for him. Now, there, there's some application we need to make about this. And so point number two is, is what can we learn from this psalm? This application we need to make in the first one is this, that being blessed does not equate to having an easy life. Now, when I think of David, there, there are certainly some physical blessings that he had. There's no doubt about that. I mean, there, there, there's no doubt that God blessed him tremendously. But there's also not a whole lot of doubt that as you look at David's life, he really had some things that were, were very hard. I mean, we think about it, and I mean, sometimes we, we, we read through things, and maybe because it's, a, it's, it's an account that we've been familiar with since, you know, many of us since the time we were children, we just kind of read it and, and take it for granted for what it says. But you really think about David and the life that he lived. I mean, here's a man who from the time... He became king, but by the time he started to rise up in, in the minds of people, 
from just a shepherd, from the time that, that he fought Goliath and, 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 and got some fame from that and then kind of became the soldier that, that got some fame from that, from, from that time where he started to rise, there was a king, Saul, who wanted him dead. I don't, don't just glance over that. Can you imagine the, the, the inner turmoil that you would be going through if you knew the king, the most powerful man in all the land, wanted you dead? That's, that's rough. And he wasn't the only one. I mean, David spent a good part of his life hiding. He spent a good part of his life running away. Uh, being, being, being someone who lived in secret in, in caves and, and just, just running from places. Had lots of people who wanted him dead and wanted, wanted to harm him. You think about his life and, and he's somebody who lost an infant child. He's somebody who, who went through the, the pain of, of losing a, an adult child. And he went through a lot of really difficult, challenging things in life. So just because you think of David as a blessed man, don't think that his life was always easy. It wasn't. And, and we get into this, this mindset sometimes that, that when things are going well for us physically, we say, well, we're very blessed. And then when things don't go for, well for us physically, we think that we're not blessed. I realize that, that being blessed isn't about how big of a house you have. Being blessed isn't about how nice of cars you have and, and, and how much money you have in the bank. Being blessed isn't only a physical thing. And sometimes we... we, we we think of it that way. I mean, certainly there are physical blessings, but, but there's all, all kinds of varying degrees of physical blessings. And yet, probably the most well-known passage that, that talks about those spiritual ones is Ephesians 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You know what? I, I, I might be just as broke as I can be, but I, if I'm in Christ, then I'm as blessed as is anybody else who's in Christ. There's all kinds of varying degrees of physical blessings, but, but if, if you're spiritually blessed, then, then you have every bit as much of spiritual blessings as anybody else. You're talking about forgiveness of sins and, and talking about redemption and, and all those wonderful things that, that Ephesians 1 will talk about, uh, being adopted as sons, being seen as holy and blameless before him in love, all those wonderful spiritual blessings, not a one of them are left out for somebody who's in Christ. That no matter what your physical condition is, if you are in Christ, then you are blessed beyond measure. And what a wonderful thing that is. And, and the second point I want to get from this is that God is our true source of comfort. You know, throughout, I guess, the, the, the later part of my life, uh, since I've been a preacher anyway, I've been asked to do a lot of funerals. And, and when, I, when I get asked to do funerals, usually I get asked to do the graveside service uh, out there when, when they, they're, they're about to... To, for the last time, put the body to rest, I guess we'd say, and, 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 and get ready to bury, and, and the people gather around. And, and many times you're, you're asked to, to give a few words out there, probably not as long of a sermon as you would give in the building, but, but a few words. And, and I tell you, I, I guess since I've been a preacher, every time I've done it, I've read this passage. Because I don't know a better way to comfort somebody than, than this. You know, Life can be hard sometimes. There's no doubt about that. You know, some, sometimes, truth be told, some, sometimes life's not fair. Treat, people treat us bad. Bad things happen. Uh, and we ask sometimes, you know, how can I be comforted in a world that sometimes offers so much pain and hurt? Many people grieve. I mean, I, I tell you, I, I've done funerals for, for, for lots of people. People, I, mean, I, I, I did a funeral once for a, a stillborn child, a mother who, who never got to hold her, her living baby, and, and, and she was heartbroken about it. And, and sometimes it, it, it's, it's spouses, and sometimes it's siblings, and sometimes it's parents, and sometimes it's children. And, and there are things in this life that hurt. I mean, they, they hurt more than, than I could describe in words. There's, there's pain that people go through that's real and it's hard. And we wonder sometimes, how can we get through it? 
How could I be comfort? How can I find comfort in, in a world that sometimes offers so much pain? In all honesty, if it, if it weren't for God, there's no way. If, if I didn't have the Lord, then, then, then I, there, there's things I just can't be comforted through. If you don't have the Lord, then, then, then there's just no way that anybody can bring comfort or, or consolation to you in certain situations. But with God, there's always a source of comfort. It doesn't mean you won't hurt. I mean, you think of David, certainly uh, he wept at the loss of his children. It, it, it's not going to mean that you never go through pain, but there's still comfort in the end of it all. That, that no matter how bad this life gets, God is there. Sometimes people die. Sometimes people hurt us. And yet God is faithful and true and there. He doesn't die. He doesn't do you wrong. He's there. He's your rock, and he's one we can always depend upon. And so David says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. It's a beautiful psalm, probably the most well-known psalm in all the Bible, and I think for good reason. It's because it offers comfort and teaches us things about God that bring peace to our lives. There might be some in this auditorium tonight who who have not lived that way. God has not been their shepherd. That, that God isn't, the, that, that they are sheep and, and yet not turning to the true shepherd and that though God is offering provision and that God is offering blessings, not, not necessarily always in a physical sense, but God is offering you the, the spiritual blessings. He's offering you so much. You just haven't been willing to turn to him. And, and as Troy pointed out this morning, you're, you haven't been hearing his voice. I beg you, turn to him. Hear his voice. Follow him. And it will bring your life comfort and peace and blessings like your life has never known. If we can help you this evening, turn to the Lord. There might be some who need to be baptized for the remission of their sins. Others might need to know how to turn to God. And we would love to sit down and study with you. Maybe some just haven't been following him and, and, and they need to repent of that and get their life right uh, with him again. If we can help you get your life right with God and start to follow your shepherd, we would love to do that. If we can, why don't you sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing the song of invitation.